morning, sisters and brothers. Good morning. What a joy to be here. I uh, am grateful for the wonderful hospitality that I've received and the good welcome. Uh, I am grateful to be in this incredible place in partnership with you as we seek to follow Jesus, the, the dream of the realm of heaven coming on earth, uh, to be a part of making peace and justice and to be together in building community. And to be a part of this community is a, is a great joy. Uh, our daughter uh, was here with her grandchildren and, uh, last night, and uh, we were walking around, and, and uh, our little six years old, who's in first grade, she said, wow, there's the Capitol, there's the Supreme Court building. She said, Dad, it's all going to change, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, yeah, because this building over here, the Methodist building, is full of all these people that are working for God to change it. Uh, well, may it be so in the name of the God who came in Jesus uh, to change our hearts so that we might be a part of a community of change in this world. It's just great to be here. And I want to particularly thank those of you who are not United Methodists uh, for your wonderful welcome. You know, the, the good book talks about forbearance being a great Christian virtue, and I want to thank you already for the saintly forbearance uh, you give us United Methodists for living in the same house with us. So thanks be to God. I think God is pleased when God sees this wonderful gathering of the community from many, many different perspectives, all committed to the one goal of a world change, transform through Jesus Christ. So thanks be to God. And thank you, Connie, for uh, the wonderful leadership and worship and the others. And of course, Joanne McLean, what a great joy it is to be a partner in ministry with her, to be colleagues in, in serving, not so much the Council of Bishops, but trying to serve the servants of God for the transformation of the world also. And uh, uh, Joanne uh, has just this wonderful way of telling bishops where to go. Uh, I mean, you know, to the next meeting. particular place. So it's a great joy uh, uh, to be here and to be a part of that. Well, it's election season, if you hadn't noticed. And I just, uh, getting into town, have noticed a lot of that and, and uh, have sort of gotten caught up in it all. When I left Boston late in August, why there was one of the TV stations that had done an analysis. And in Boston, and you have to understand, it's Boston, but in Boston, they, 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 uh, they, they thought that they had, there had been about a billion, they, I don't know who counted this, but there had been nearly a billion words spewed across the air from here, there, and everywhere about the politics of the day. A billion words. Words, words, words. And after all the ads and the ad libs and the ad nauseum talk is done, what finally counts? What finally counts? They had on one of the talk, talk shows up in, in Boston a, an old fella who, who, who put it this way. He says, I'm, I'm tired of all the schmoozing. Let's get to the doozing. <laughs> that is, let's go from the talk to the walk. Let's get to the action. I think maybe he had read the book of James, the little letter of James, this little letter that Martin Luther, pardon me for any of the, uh, the Lutherans in the house, uh, Martin Luther thought was the epistle of straw and ought to be done away with. But John Wesley, praise the Lord, is there an amen in the house? John Wesley said that the book of James is at the center of Christian faith and practice. Because this little letter of James, it doesn't have many words, note. This little book of James, this little letter of James, John Wesley said, takes on what he called the grand pest of Christianity, which is faith without works. That's John Wesley's quote takes on the grand pest of Christianity, faith without words. Do you know anything about that? Do you know anything about lots of words that don't go any place in terms of the works? Do you know anything about lots of jabbering that doesn't 
and are into any kind of living. It's not just about politicians. I want us to think about ourselves right here in this building today and what we're doing. And I want to read for you uh, out of the third chapter of James these words as Eugene Peterson translates them. It was in last week's lectionary. It's what caught my attention. This was the full portion. thought about coming here to be with you. Here it is. Do you want to be counted wise? To build a reputation for wisdom? Here's what you do. Live well. Live wisely. Live humbly. It's the way you live, not the way you talk, that counts. Let me just say that one more time in case you missed it. It's the way you and I live, not the way we talk, that counts. Now, I must confess, I was, and I don't know, Connie, if you were, pardon me, but the little picture they put up of, you know, this. <laughs> <laughs> Pete, it's not the way you talk, it's the way you live. Get the finger down and offer it out as a hand in terms of living. <laughs> so what counts? Live well, live wisely, live humbly. It's the way you live, not the way you talk, that counts. Mean-spirited ambition isn't wisdom. Boasting that you are wise isn't wisdom. Twisting the truth to make yourself sound wise isn't wisdom. It's the furthest thing from wisdom. It's animal cunning, devilish conniving. Whenever you're trying to look better than others or get the better of others, things fall apart. And everyone ends up at each other's throats. But real wisdom, God's wisdom, begins with a holy life and is characterized by getting along with others. It is gentle and reasonable, overflowing with mercy and blessings, not hot one day and cold the next, not two-faced. You can develop a healthy, robust community that lives right with God and enjoy its results only if you do the hard work of getting along with each other, treating each other with dignity and with honor. Easy for us to think about that in relationship to the politicians, but what about us? What about our words? Uh, I remember getting a, a letter uh, some years ago uh, in, in the office, and, and it's, it, it said, uh, uh, Dear Bishop Babel, Dear Bishop Babel. And then the letter went on to talk about how, uh, and they were probably right, I had used lots of words about our solidarity with the poor. But then at annual conference, we had just voted a bishop. We had just voted a budget that was full of self-interest, was full of taking care of ourselves. And the writer of the letter ended up in saying, it's just a bundle of Babel. Bishop Babel. <laughs> well, I took it to heart. This is a house of words, isn't it? You and I are constantly uh, doing words. This morning, Joanne and I were, you know, generating words upon words upon words. Uh, it's, it's, it's how you live, not how you talk, that really finally then counts. Uh, yesterday, one of the staff members of the General Board of Church and Society came in with a, a statement about Israel, a very serious matter and a very good statement. It had been ecumenically developed. Everybody's had a hand, put a word here, put a word there, put a word someplace else. We know how to develop statements, don't we? <laughs> statements and statements. So I said to, to, to Mark, I said, well, now, uh, what, what's our book of resolutions say? Now, if uh, you're not a United Methodist, this is our book of resolutions. 
thousand pages plus of, of, of words. And, and Joanne has put COB for the Council of Bishops, so it does, somebody doesn't walk off with it. Who in the world would ever want to walk off with this book? <laughs> but we got all the words. But are we living it out in terms of peace with justice and love? And as James said, the building of community where we have humility and we honor each other, we have dignity, we work hard at getting along with each other, not just those with whom we agree, but with those who are our adversaries. Oh, if it were the resolutions, if it were all the words, if it were the resolutions that would bring the revolution, the solutions would have been found long ago. Amen? Well, Words can be useful, but only as an invitation to the living, because that's what counts, James says. Kierkegaard has a wonderful line where, reflecting upon the Christians of his day, he says, there is no lack of information in the Christian land, or I might paraphrase it there, there's no lack of words in the Christian land. Something else is lacking. And what he goes on to talk about is essentially those who are ready to live God's love and God's peace and God's justice. There's no lack of words in this building. How are we doing at living it out? Maybe just starting here, a story, and then I'll conclude. The first big peace rally I was ever a part of was here in Washington, D.C. in 1968. Uh, it was, some of you remember, an organization called Clergy and Laity Concerned About the War in Vietnam had organized a rally at New York Avenue Presbyterian Church. I was in seminary at the time. We brought a group down from Drew Theological School and we were sitting in the back of the sanctuary. William Sloan Coffin was leading the proceedings uh, Martin Luther King Jr. was there. Some of you will remember the controversy that surrounded he, his beginning to, to put his living, his life on the line around matters of peace as well as the incredible racism uh, of that time and that continues in our time. Uh, Dr. Coffin had started the proceeding and a uh, place was packed and and, and sitting in the back, you couldn't quite see what was happening, except that a guy had stood up in the front pew and started to talk back to Dr. Coffin. And then there were a couple of others that stood up and started to talk back. And, and the rumors went throughout the congregation until those of us in the back heard that it was Carl McIntyre. Now, some of you are too young to remember that name, but he was from New Jersey, Collingswood, New Jersey. He had founded a denomination called the Bible Presbyterian Church. He uh, had a radio broadcast on 600 radio stations across America entitled the 20th Century Reformation Hour. He had organized pro-Vietnam War rallies, and he had appeared in Nor New York Avenue Presbyterian Church that day to argue the case for the war with Dr. Coffin and Dr. King sitting up there on the dais in the chancel. Well, you know, my, I, I started to go hot. What's, what's, what's James say about sometimes hot, sometimes cold? I was hot. We all had the words. We all had our statements. We all knew uh, about the war. and and the, the, the way it was dividing our world and our country and how the, the Jesus talked about being peacemakers, not just peace talkers, but peacemakers. And, and, and I expected there would be somebody that would come out and would usher Dr. McIntyre and his supporters out immediately. But instead, Dr. Coffin invited Brother McIntyre to come up to the pulpit. And he said something like this. He said, we both believe in Jesus, don't we? And Dr. McIntyre shook his head. And we both believe this scripture is inspired, don't we? Dr. McIntyre shook his head. And then Dr. Coffin said, let's have a conversation on our common ground. 
And there began to unfold a conversation where actually, to my surprise, I confess it, Dr. McIntyre was drawn into the conversation. Uh, he had a different point of view. He expressed it clearly. But there was a respect. There was a, a common ground on which they met. And they began to not just share words, but, but there was a sense of living together in a community, in a broken world, yearning for God's will in the midst of that broken world. Uh, both with the same objective, all of us yearning for how we might live in a way that reflects that realm of God on earth even as it is in heaven. Well, as things finally unfolded, Dr. Uh, Williamson Coffin invited Dr. McIntyre to walk with us. We were going to then process out of New York Avenue Presbyterian Church and head across the Memorial Bridge led by Dr. King up into the Arlington Cemetery and a quiet witness for peace and for healing for a broken world and a broken nation. Now, I don't know whether Dr. McIntyre joined us. Never saw that. It was a large crowd or any of his supporters. But what I do know is that before we left New York Avenue Presbyterian Church, Dr. King briefly addressed it. Not many words, but the one thing that he said that I remember clearly was, as we go, Whomever we meet, let us live peace. Let us live peace. You want to be counted wise, James asked. Live well, live wisely, live humbly. For it's the way we live, not the way we talk that finally counts. And as that silent march wound its way into Arlington Cemetery, the carillon began to play. Da, 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 All the words are needed as an invitation to be a fellowship of love that begins to live it in these halls and these places so that what we put on paper begins to flow out into our actions, our living. What about you? I'm so delighted to be here and to be a part of living this message of love, peace, justice, hope, salvation, in the name of Jesus. I'm Pete Weaver, and I approve this message. <laughs>